So I want to do a little something. I've done this in the men's dorm. I don't know if the sisters know it, but if you do know it, please join me. Guys, I'm speaking to you, and sisters, please join us. Oh, friends, do you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Sure. Say now, why do you love Jesus? Because he first loved me, that's the reason we all are to love him. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Is that the reason you're here this morning? Amen. So with that being said, Dr. Carl is still our speaker for this week. I believe his title is, What is the Mark of the Beast? Or something of that sort. So Dr. Carl, I just pray that the Lord will speak through you and for you this morning. I invite you to give the opening prayer. Thank you, Junior. Yes, what is the, it's pretty close. What is the image to the beast? Uh, before we We'll break open the word. Let's uh, kneel in prayer as we approach the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, indeed, we will need to have the love of Jesus in our hearts. For it's only the power of his love that can help us to discern and help us to make the kinds of decisions that will warn the world of the things that are about to take place. May you send your Holy Spirit here to, to stir up our pure hearts and minds uh, to get a better understanding. Thank you for this promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to begin today with a statement from the eighth volume of the testimonies. This is page 159. And you can also find it in different... Um, in different passages in her writing, like 6th volume of the Testimonies, page 17. But I'm going to read 8 to 159 as we begin this morning. After quoting Isaiah, the 58th chapter, verses 12 to 14, this ch that chapter basically talks about the, the, the Sabbath and uh, we are the restorers of the breach uh, that has been made in the wall. The wall is a symbol and an imagery of the law of God. And so it talks about us being the restorers of the breach, so like restoring the Sabbath in the law of God. And then she says, this is our work. The light we have upon the third angel's message is the true light. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. And then these words. Not all in regard to this matter is yet understood and will not be understood until the unrolling of the scroll, but a most solemn work is to be accomplished in our world. Notice that. She says, the, the message that we have been preaching concerning the third angel's message, it is the true light. Uh, it is, the mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. So no questions regarding that. However, when these, un when these events begin to unfold, there's, there's a caution here. At least in my mind, there is a caution because it says not all in regard to this matter is yet understood. And so that's a call for prayer. That's a call for the searching of the scriptures. That's a call for submitting our positions to the scrutiny of others, and just like our early pioneers did in the Sabbath conferences of 1848, uh, we will, through this process, get a better understanding of where it is uh, or how we should understand these things and then what we, should, what we should do. And so if you have come to the position that, hey, well, the, the mark of the beast is the opposite of the seal of God, and that's equated with the image of the beast, and well, I, that, that's pretty much it. And the image to the beast is the church state system. Okay, well, what else is there? And so it's, it's in that aspect that she, uh, I guess, says to me that not all is yet understood regarding this matter. So in other words, there's a development. There's a, there's a, there's a depth that we need to come to grips with here. 
And so as we think about the, the beast, its image, its mark, and the number of his name, what are, the, what are the distinctions between these? And one of the ways in which we can think about it is if you compare the first four commandments with the beast, its image, its mark, and the number of its, of its name. For instance, in the first commandment, you have a prohibition against worshiping false gods. Thou shalt have no other gods before, before me. In Revelation chapter 13, there's a, uh, there's a statement that says they worship the beast. So instead of worshiping God, they worship the beast. Well, as you go to the second commandment, there's a prohibition against idols. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above the earth beneath the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. And it goes on. So there's a prohibition against idolatry. And then in Revelation 13, 14, it says they make an image to the beast. So, of course, God comes before the idol and the beast comes before the image, that's the logical sense here. And then in the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, uh, because the Lord will not hold him guiltless who does so. Well, in Revelation 13, 17, it talks about the number of the beast's name. And then you get to the fourth commandment, uh, and it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then there is the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16. So just like all the first four commandments are interrelated but yet distinct, kind of like the body is like an interrelationship of, of mental, physical, spiritual, and social, they're all, inter, they're all interrelated aspects. They all kind of work together in the formation of character. So the first four commandments are completely, they are interrelated but yet distinct, and so... The same principles should apply to our understanding of who constitutes the beast, what is the image to the beast, the number of his name, and then the mark of the beast as well. So there is a warning about worshiping the image to the beast. And if that is so, then the Lord would have us understand what this image is really all about. And so I want to uh, have you turn with me in your Bibles and we'll spend uh, some time in the book of Revelation reading, just reading these verses that deal with the image to the beast. And so we're going to first go to Revelation chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. And of course it begins in verse 11 where you have uh, another beast coming up out of the earth with two horns like a lamb and speaking like a dragon. And we go to verse 14 of Revelation chapter 13, and it says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now notice the mark hasn't come in yet in this chapter, but it clearly states that when the image is formed, there is a death decree regarding the image. Then it moves on to the mark in, chapter, uh, in verse 16. So we go to the next chapter, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9, and this is the beginning of the third angel's message. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, they get the wrath of God, which is the plagues in chapter 15. So notice, there is the worship of the beast and his image. They're related, but yet Distinct. So we go to chapter 15, the very next chapter, and uh, we'll read verses 1 and 2. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over 
the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So do you see the distinctions there? So they, they not only get victory over the beast, but over his image. Now, just like a false god is not equated with the image of the false god, the, the two are distinct, right? So the first commandment makes a prohibition against worshiping false gods. Well, the second one makes a prohibition uh, against, well, worshiping really the true God with false forms, but, you know, uh, thou shalt not make an image of that God. So there is a distinction between the two. And we need to articulate that distinction, and I'm not sure that uh, I will be able to do that uh, this morning. So this is very exploratory. Um, but I thought I'd do something more than just, okay, the image is a church-state system. Okay, fine. Um, how does that kind of gel with the statement that I read, not all in regard to this matter is yet understood and will not be understood until the unrolling of the scroll? So that's kind of what I was wrestling with. Okay, we all know. We can all read that chapter in the great controversy. Well, how is the beast formed? Oh, how, okay, well, that's how the image is going to be formed. Okay, but, but what is it? You know, what, what, are the, what, are the, what are all of the component parts that make it what it is? That, that's really what I'm trying to get at. What are the component parts? Because if we don't account for all of the component parts, then we'll not be able to recognize the thing and how it operates. We read chapter 15, verse 2. Notice chapter 16 also. So we go to the next chapter. Uh, in verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grief a sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. So again, making a distinction between those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the image. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. It states, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. That's almost like a reference back to Revelation chapter 13 with which he deceived them that had uh, uh, received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, this is um, where the millennium begins. It says, I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It seems to me that it's possible to maybe not worship the beast, but then fall into the trap of maybe worshipping his image. Or you could possibly worship the image and worship the beast, but what about the mark? And so where do we fall in all, in, in all of this? How do we put all the pieces of the puzzle together? Uh, it appears to me from the reading of these texts that there appears to be a chronological progression when examining these texts. The beast obviously comes first, just like the first commandment comes first. And then the image, just like the second commandment, comes after the first commandment, and yet the two are distinct. And finally, when that is developed, when that is all set up, then you have the mark, which is enforced. So it talked about worshiping the beast, and this is not restricted to what is done on the Sabbath and should not merely be restricted to the battle between um, Sabbath and Sunday and the mark of the beast and the seal of God. For instance, just a little commentary on the word uh, worship, broadening it to not just what we do like in a corporate sense when we're gathered here together and on Sabbath. If you remember the third temptation in the wilderness, you know, the devil kind of pulls, you know, he pulls the face mask off and he says, all right, it's me. Um, you know, if you bow down, I'll, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. If you'll just bow down and worship me, you know, I'll give you all. 
And Jesus responds by saying, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And then how does it end? It says, And him only shalt thou serve. So our service is an indicator of whom we are worshiping. And worship is much broader than, than you know, the usual, okay, I'm here to open up my Bible and pray. Uh, our service is an indicator of who we are worshiping. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your, dead, your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And then Romans 6, 16, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And so uh, it appears that much more is involved here when we think about the prohibition against worshiping the image to the beast as well. When we covered the King of the South uh, in the previous uh, lectures, we noted that one reason for why the Bible selected the word king is, uh, uh, to describe him is that a king's administration covers many areas, education, politics, economics, religion. And so if you're in my History of Christianity class, we have learned that um, the devil practices ideological divide and conquer by dichotomizing things from each other. You know how I, I was watching a, a video of... Um, I forget the animal, but let's say it was bison. And as long as they were kind of in their formation with their, their, you know, their horns out, um, just kind of all in a circle, there's nothing that the wolves could do. But wolves are very tenacious and patient. And so finally, one of them got spoofed and started running off in a different direction than the herd. And that was it. Then the wolves just kind of go, you know, where is the weak one? You know, bang, lock, on, lock in on it. And that's it. Divide and conquer. Well, just like that happens in the animal world, it happens in the ideological world as well. There is a divide and conquer that, ha that has happened all throughout the history of Christianity. And if we're not careful, we could end up dichotomizing the image and the mark of the beast to just Sunday. And in the words of 8th volume of the testimonies, let me remind you that the light we have received upon the third angel's message is the true light and the mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. So we're not doing anything to upset that foundation. However, if, uh, if we begin to dichotomize um, Sunday from economics and politics and some of these other things, then we're just going to sit back and wait and wait and the image is going to form and then finally it will come to Sunday and then we'll wake up and say, oh, it's time for us to warn the world. When for some, it will be too late. They, have, they have, will have already been deceived into this. And so we cannot come to the position where we are dichotomizing these things. And as much as we want to stay away from politics, you know, I always tell students that there's, one, there's only one subject more complicated than theology. You know, to learn how to be saved is not a difficult matter. You look and you live. It's, that, it's really that simple. It's appropriating the love of Christ into your own heart. It's, it's not that difficult. But when you talk about theology, that's an entirely different matter. And when you talk about politics, politics mixes philosophy, theology, history. All of these things are all combined into one, okay? And so we're not going to be able to just hide as Adventists saying, oh, that's politics and I'm not going to be able to say much about it. You know, something interesting happened in 1888 as well. Um, if you read some of the, uh, uh, the American Sentinel, and you read the fifth volume of the Testimonies, uh, th these, these issues were kind of being agitated, but it, back in 1888, it was kind of more like in your face. 
you know, we're really going for the establishment of religion, and that's what's going to happen. And many of the brethren thought at that time that that has nothing to do with the third angel's message. And she shot back and said, it has everything to do with it. So there was a bunch of confusion among us during that time, and many thought that maybe these were just political issues in which we shouldn't be involved. And then she shot back and said, nothing could be further from the truth. Now, do you think if there was confusion back then that there might be confusion today? I will submit that there will be. And so we cannot come to the point where we begin to dichotomize all these subjects. So when the king of the south attacked the king of the north, uh, many believed that the temporal power of the papacy had come to an end. So its political, economic, and polit religious power, many thought, was done. But in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, there uh, was prophesied a restoration of that power because it says that the king of the north would come against the king of the south with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and would pass over into all the countries and would just kind of like an overflowing river and, uh, and, 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 and torrential downpour, it would just devastate. So it talks about a restoration of its power leading to uh, or comprising the healing of the wound. So when you compare Daniel 11.40 with Revelation 13, I believe those are complementary passages. How did the beast form? Well, there are several things. Um, we could go to Daniel chapter 11, verse around 30 or so, and we covered this in our History of Christianity class, when arms shall become part of the king of the north. So the king of the north has always sought to have political and economic factors so that it can increase its dogmas. That's what indeed happened. Then you get the donation of Constantine later, and what the church sought was religious supremacy, but also temporal supremacy, political and economic supremacy. Without that, it could not reign over the kings of Europe. So if all those things were involved in the formation of the beast, then all those things are going to be also involved in the, in the image as well. So when these economic policies are being debated and all these things are going on and, uh, and political questions are being raised, we need to have some kind of filter. We need to have some kind of a criteria for being able to distinguish what's pure party politics from what will have a devastating effect, not only on us, but on the rest of the world. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and all that is worshipped. In that text, it says that a falling away or an apostasy prepares for the man of sin to be revealed. If you look at the rest of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, it matches pretty perfectly what's in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 to 39. So it is an apostasy that prepares the way for the formation of the beast. So if apostasy prepared the way for the formation of the beast, then it may be entirely plausible that ha, the king of the south maybe is playing a role uh, by making war against the king of the north after 1798 and also preparing the way for an image to the beast. So remember, when the king of the south is done, uh, its Marxist agenda and political and economic philosophies have become worldwide, as well as its degeneracy when it comes to marriage and then all the other issues that we're facing to, uh, today in the world. So these will have devastating effects on us politically and economically. And we can see a complete restoration to the power of the king of the north. Chariots, horses, those are like military weapons. What about ships? Ships can also be used for military, but they can also be used for economics as well and trade. In Revelation 13, 16, and 17, after setting up the image and the death decree for those who would not worship it, the mark is placed on the right hand or on the forehead and no one is allowed to buy or sell. Well, that, that's definitely talking about politics and economics, is it not? 
In Revelation 13, 11, the nation that comes up out of the earth has two horns like a lamb. And as long as it's adhering to the principles of those two lamb-like horns, republicanism and Protestantism, the image could never be formed. It could never be formed. Now, what is the grid? What is the framework? What is the criteria as we begin to examine some of these issues and policies? What is the criteria through which we should look to? I think it's right there in Revelation 13, 11. The nation that comes up has two horns like a lamb. Notice, but then it says, but there's a contrast there. So there's a contrast between those two horns, republicanism and Protestantism. By the, by the way, republicanism is not a party. It is a form of government that is based on immutable laws instead of the will of the people, uh, instead of a pure democracy. So the United States is not a pure democracy, which is kind of why it's scary to me when some people want to do away with the electoral college that would move us into a pure democracy. And the founding fathers very wisely said no, that would disenfranchise everyone of the power of their vote. So as long as those two, those two principles are there, there is, there's no way for the image to be formed. So where would the devil be attacking? He would be attacking in terms of political and economic principles that are going to chip away at all of these things. And so if we say, oh, that's just economics, or that's just politics, but yet it is preparing the way for the image, which means a restoration of political and economic power, because without that, you can't enforce a mark. If we just say, well, these, ha these things have nothing to do with our message, then are we really being true to our message. Great Controversy, page 564, it says, the Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is dearer or more fundamental. Fundamental. Underscore that word. Fundamental means with any, when anything comes in contact with it, it doesn't matter what it is. Come hell or high water. Fundamental means we are not going to budge on this thing. That's what fundamental means. But the things that we have been going through recently are convincing me that in the minds of many, it is not fundamental. And here I am on page two with four more pages to go. So I think this is a good spot to end because tomorrow we'll be talking about how the king of the north invades the glorious land. So I will pick up a little bit on this, expand on it, and then look at the king of the north and the glorious land tomorrow. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we have come here for such a time as this, and we pray that you will anoint us with your Holy Spirit to help us to see. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.